de cette mobilisation à la grandeur des Amériques, c'est qu'on a eu une mobilisation sociale. On the 27th of this year, I arrived in San Luis Potosí, in Mexico, to join an international caravan on social and environmental justice. So I was part of a nine-person delegation that included my colleague here, Louise, and actually I know another Canadian in the audience here who was on the same caravan out there. And uh, we were part of this nine-person delegation, including Council of Canadians, members of the Public Service Alliance of Canada and the Polaris Institute. So these caravans were headed through communities in Mexico towards the Cancun talks, the UN climate talks. And along the way, we stopped in different communities. And the concept of these caravans is it gave us the opportunity to meet with people who were engaged in struggles both against driving forces of the climate crisis as well as facing the impacts of the climate crisis. So it provided us an opportunity to hear from them and hear from their struggles and bring those messages and that, that reasoning to be engaged in this global act of solidarity in calling our leaders to account for the climate crisis. Let's see here. Next year. So that's a little shot here of us arriving in San Luis Potosí. So I've been asked today to speak about our experiences on the caravans. And I, I think these experiences are a very good example of the strength of global north-south solidarity. And I also think that they have some key lessons for building our climate justice movement here in Canada, as well as lessons on what we can do around moving forward this concept of ecological debt and actually seeking the repayment of ecological debt here in Canada. So I want to talk about our stop in Cerro San Pedro. It was very exemplary of, of what we saw in this caravan and I think is particularly relevant to a Canadian audience. So we went to Cerro San Pedro to meet with local populations who have been deeply impacted and affected by a gold and silver mine. It's a subsidiary of a company called New Gold and guess where they're based? They're based in Vancouver. So we, we went to San Pedro and we were welcomed in the town square by, a, it was quite an incredible event actually. We had musicians and we had a number of community speakers lined up to tell us exactly about this years long struggle that they've been engaged in against New Gold. And what we heard is that this mountain, which you can sort of see in the background of the picture of the dry river there, this mountain which was tied to their cultural identity, their historical identity, this company has literally come in and ripped off the top of that mountain in order to get access to the gold and silver there. <clears throat> in the extraction process, new gold uses cyanide to help separate the minerals from the rock. And what we heard directly from community members is this has polluted their water. What we heard from them is that they feel that that pollution is the source of the growing illnesses that they're seeing in their community. We further learned that the, the rock that was used or left over from blasting the top off this mountain for this open pit mine was then dumped on a river. And that river, this picture we have here, we later walked over a bridge and saw the dry parched ground left from that act of this corporation. And I want to show here some artwork. Um, as we walk through this, I must emphasize this historic village built in the 1500s. Um, buildings here, that's another point that they raised. The buildings themselves are actually being impacted by the blasting because this mountain is literally right beside their community. Um, this is a little bit of artwork representing some of the impacts of the mining, the feeling of, of the mining in the, in the community. And when they talked about water, the concerns were not only the pollution of water, but also the depletion of water, the aquifer for which they're getting the water that they're using, and they're using significant amounts of it. Uh, San Luis Potosí, which is very nearby this community of, of San Pedro, it's a city of one million. They depend on that aquifer for their water, and local agricultural uh, companies in the area also depend on that water. So there's a serious concern around the depletion of water. I also want to emphasize that when community members talk to us, they describe this mine as an illegal mine. And that's because, in fact, it is a legal mine. For years, they've been fighting this mine in court. Uh, in 2009, 
a decision was actually made in court affirming that this land permit um, that the company claimed that they had was in fact uh, it wasn't in fact real or it wasn't it wasn't realized by the court and the reason why the permit was found in violation is because it was violating laws pertaining to the right to water and health guaranteed by the Mexican uh, Constitution, as well as a decree passed by San Luis Potosi, which recognized this area, this zone around Cerro San Pedro, as a reserve for the preservation and restoration of rare and endemic species of flora and fauna. So basically, you have this year-long, years-long battle where you have courts affirming that, in fact, this is an illegal mine, and what you see is the company uh, either ignoring or appealing this consistently, and uh, accusations of corruption and collusion with local environmental authorities, which is, which is literally, despite the very clear impacts that it could have and is having, uh, allows this mine to continue. In fact, I just want to highlight here in Montreal, FAO Montreal, uh, one person is actually uh, a Canadian, well, somebody in Canada now who uh, actually had to leave Cerro San Pedro was part of this and has seeked asylum in Canada. And in fact, in Montreal, there's this group that has done some really uh, incredible mobilization about this particular example of a mine in Mexico. So the Canadian delegation were so moved by what we heard and witnessed um, we used the opportunity to present community members in Cerro San Pedro uh, a letter signed by over 36 organizations noting our regret that we failed to pass Bill C-311 and also ensuring that we're going to make a commitment to take this story of Cerro San Pedro back to audience like this in Canada and to mobilize public opinion to hold extractive industries accountable not only here in our country but abroad. And for those of you who might not be familiar with it, Bell C-311 is the corporate accountability of mining, oil, and gas accountability in uh, developing countries. That act was defeated by a very, very narrow margin right before we were actually in Cerro San Pedro. So you might ask, why was Cerro San Pedro included in a caravan about the climate crisis? So, uh, while Cerro San Pedro itself wasn't necessarily about greenhouse gas emissions, and I will assure you on this caravan, we did see a lot of, of concerns around greenhouse gas emissions, be it local fossil fuel industries or export-oriented agriculture. The reason why it was included in a caravan about climate justice is because Cerro San Pedro is emblematic of the struggle of putting profit above the interests of people in the environment that is at the heart of the environmental, climate, and social crisis that we face. That's why Cerro San Pedro was on this struggle. And what that says to me, it says to me we have a lesson here from the climate justice movement. It says when we talk about climate crisis, we don't just talk about how, we, how do we reduce emissions and needing to reduce emissions. We talk about what is driving those emissions, what is the structural causes, what are the equity dimensions, both of how we got to where we're at and how we're actually looking at the solutions to the climate crisis we face. And last, uh, last April's World People's Conference on climate change and the rights of Mother Earth in Cochabamba, Bolivia, was really about that perspective. It was about building an alternative dialogue. And I would encourage everybody who hasn't seen it to go and take a look at that people's agreement. There's a lot of really incredible uh, words and documentation and ideas about real solutions to the climate crisis in there that do start looking at, at questions of how do, we, how do we begin to address the system of overproduction and overconsumption and a global economic model that's export oriented and uh, is exploiting both people and the environment. That was about that alternative dialogue. And I do think that this can help inform our mobilizing here in Canada with a climate justice movement. What it says to me is when we go to organize around climate change, we need to look past our silos. I'll borrow a little bit from Maude Barlow here. Our silos, be they labor or environment or community activists, we need to look past these silos that threaten on the surface 
to separate our efforts. But when you dig a little deeper, you realize that indeed our efforts are so much more combined than what we may realize. And whether this means uh, a community group that's fighting another coal fire plant, pairing up with health advocates worried about children nearby getting sick, with environmental advocates, with labor activists worried about the treatment of workers in uh, existing plants. Those are the types of areas that we need to start seeking out and working together on within the climate justice movement. I think the caravan's featuring of local struggles, like San Pedro, also provides insight on the topic of ec ecological debt, what we can do to correct the injustice that we're currently faced with, and how we look at solutions to this, and how we seek repayment of debt in Canada. So the stories and experiences of the caravans uh, that we were on brought us forward to Cancun and gave us the reason and the passion to go and do what we did in, in Cancun, to call accountability on the part of our government. It strengthened the movement by bringing the voices of people who were impacted by the various industries that are helping fuel the climate crisis, as well as being impacted by climate change itself. That helped inform the passion that we saw in the streets in Cancun and in the alternative spaces and in the UN process itself calling for change. I continue to be inspired by what I heard and saw in Cerro San Pedro. In fact, that inspiration is leading me to Toronto along with, I hope, many others on May 4th while New Gold has its AGM shareholder meeting. And I would encourage all of you, if you're interested in joining us, we will have two people from Cerro San Pedro coming to that AGM. And that, I think, is another opportunity for global north-south solidarity. There is value and strength in listening and acting alongside people who are fighting the industries driving climate change and fighting the impacts of climate change, be they in the global south or here in the global north. There is strength in those stories. And when we seek to, to see the repayment of climate debt and conveying this to fellow Canadians, that is only going to be strengthened if we can bring those stories to the fore, if we can tie it to equity and what it means in terms of people's lives. Our opportunities to communicate with others, be they our neighbor or in a school or in a church or in a labor union, it is about people's stories and connecting it to that. So I think as a method in building our movement and conveying why we need to change, we need to harness these opportunities for solidarity. At the heart of the demand for ecological debt is the need for global north countries like ours to take on deeper emission reductions than elsewhere because we are historically responsible for producing the crisis we face. Now the reality we face here in the room right now is the UN climate talks just aren't going to cut it. That's the reality right now. They just aren't going to cut it. What they're talking about, they're not even talking about real solutions. And don't get me wrong, we need to have a presence there and we need to push for better. And I'm all about hearing about different creative ideas to do that. But that is the reality. And here in Canada, we're faced with a government that has this export-oriented energy vision that's so woefully behind where we need to be. Just look at our emission reduction target. It'll amount to a 2% rise above uh, 1990 emission levels by 2020. While scientists in many governments are calling for 40 to 50 percent reductions, further shameful is that we don't even have a plan to do it, right? So we are so woefully behind. We must be vigilant in calling on our governments to account. We must be vigilant in that. But it is within this context that local struggles have a place in advancing climate justice. Local struggles absolutely have a place. The same way that we featured those local struggles in the caravan, that needs to be a place we look to see the repayment of climate debt here in Canada. Not only can we actually work together in areas, local struggles, where we can actually realize real emission reductions, in that process we can build the sort of alliances that are going to help us bring the strength to our movements to demand so much more of our governments. So I put out there to everybody here that if we want the repayment of ecological debt, 
one of the key things we have to do is look in our own backyards, find out where those, cl those climate justice struggles are, plug into those, and start working to build the alliances past our silos, be they environment, be they social, community, um, labor. We need to look to build those alliances because that's going to play a key role. And I, I just want to give one Canadian example. This is the Wave Against the Pave campaign in BC. I encourage you to all take a look at it online. I've provided the link. Uh, so what they're doing in BC is they're going to prevent the expansion or the a new highway project in BC. And they have very sound reasons to say why this highway is not needed. And what they're calling for is the redirecting of the resources from this highway to public transit, to green jobs, and to protecting communities in BC against the impacts of climate change. And what they're doing, how they're doing this, is they're mobilizing on a community basis. They're mobilizing with labor unionists. They're mobilizing, they're mobilizing with community activists and environmental activists. They've already had two nonviolent direct actions, one involving uh, taking sand from a construction site, putting it in bags, and uh, actually building a dike to protect a community that they think will be impacted by rising, uh, rising sea levels as a result of climate change. Another one, which they actually did during the Cancun talks, that's a picture on the other side over there. They took those same sandbags and uh, they piled them up in front of a building, a provincial legislature building where they thought the premier was at the time, and held a rally with uh, labor activists and environmental activists and community activists. And I think it's those sorts of alliances, those sorts of opportunities to really dig in and work with each other and actually stop something. This is where I'm really seeing hope in this context, because I'm certainly not seeing hope when it comes from Harper. And to be honest, I'm not seeing a heck of a lot of hope right now when it comes to UN climate talks, but that gives me hope. Dolores Hildago, our second caravan stop, that gives me hope too. This community, what they did is they got up there and it was person after person, at least 30 people, talking about different solutions on a community level that everybody is engaged in, ranging from beekeeping to sustainable forestry to teaching people how to weave. Incredible story. I have this available up online in a blog I did. Um, but it's those kinds of examples that we need to look towards and start mobilizing. So I want to say as a Council of Canadians, we remain committed to following the UN climate talks and calling our governments to account and doing the same with our federal government, but are seeking out and looking for those opportunities to build alliances locally because that is key to the repayment of ecological debt and it's key to the advancement of climate justice in our country.